And then, and then uh, I don't think anybody will object. Hello and welcome everyone. Glad you're with us today. This is the, the series called Courageous Conversations Over Coffee, sponsored by the South Coast Interfaith Council. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation with Shukri Katan, the Operations Director for TIA, an organization whose mission is to create communities of support and to organize access to economic opportunities and critical resources for immigrants, refugees, and displaced indigenous communities. My name is Marietta Fong. I'm a member of the council and I belong to the Rolling Hills United Methodist Church here in the South Bay area of Los Angeles. Today's program will be about 45 minutes to an hour or so. And first we'll have some general questions and conversation. And then during the Q&A section near the end, you'll have an opportunity to send questions to me via the chat box, which is located probably at the right bottom of your screen so that I can share those with our guests today. Tia was founded in 2010 by refugees and women of color, quote unquote, for the places we live and the communities we serve. We embrace the strength and beauty of our different histories to build spaces and experiences where all discover belonging. The TIA Foundation was built on the personal experiences of uh, two women and uh, their core values are inclusion, kindness, empowerment, and economic advancement to help the program participants achieve economic mobility and community in the United States. Identities and gifts stretch far beyond experiences of displacement. And the foundation people believe that those who survived displacement are the true alchemists who can create life after loss. Surviving tragedies should be celebrated and they're changing the narrative. So Shukri, hello. Hi, and, how are you? Thanks for uh, reminding me to uh, grab my cup of coffee for our chat. I always forget that. <laughs> so we're ready today, aren't we? Got, got that going for us. So let's just jump right in and let me ask you to tell us a bit about your background. Um, especially the work that you did with the International Rescue Committee before you joined TIA. Sure. Um, first, thank you again for having me on. Uh, really excited to share our story and share the work of TIA with everybody um, today and with your audience. Um, so for myself, uh, my family um, experienced displacement and were refugees themselves, um, Palestinians back in 48 and uh, came to the United States in the 80s, and I was born here in the, in the US. And, uh, you know, just kind of seeing how they adapted to life in this country and the challenges they were going through. And then for myself, um, growing up kind of uh, in between two worlds, the world of my family and then the world of the US, uh, being a bridge for them at times was uh, very difficult. So. I over time wanted to do work that would help understand how to support others that kind of had a similar experience. So specifically refugees, um, since that's uh, the experience my family had and, uh, and some still continue to this day um, experience that displacement. So um, I, early in my career, I was um, fortunate enough to work as a case manager at the International Rescue Committee, uh, IRC, uh, at their office in Glendale. And uh, my role there was case manager. So I would be responsible for the first three months or 90 day period of resettlement um, for refugee families coming to LA or Orange County. Um, and this was in the early 2000s is when I first started this work. And uh, at that time we were resettling a lot of families from Iran. Um, there were uh, religious minorities fleeing uh, the country. Uh, we would help them with family reunification. And uh, I was also working very heavily with the Iraqi community. So at that time, uh, we had a lot of uh, refugees fleeing Iraq after the, the occupation in the early 2000s. And um, I had worked with them and several other 
communities of, of uh, refugees that were coming into LA through the IRC. And um, yeah, I did that work for probably three years, a little over three years, and uh, learned a lot. I learned a lot about what it takes to help families resettle, um, what are the first steps that they need to take in order to get their paperwork in line, registering their kids for school, finding them employment. Um, it's just, it's a lot and it's condensed in a short amount of time and then you're on to the next family. And I had maybe um, up to 40 cases a month that I was working on at that time. Oh my goodness. I have to ask another question. If you had 40 cases a month that you were working on personally, was there a group of people that were supporting each one of those families at that time? No. <laughs> at that time, I think there was maybe five of us who were case managers and each of us had an equal caseload. And uh, it was up to us. And we had only one other staff member that was responsible for finding employment for all of our families. So she, she was maybe the hardest working one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment in the chat. Wow. And I echo that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, well, so how, tell us more about Tia and how it got started. How did that get started? Who was involved in that and why? So Tia was founded by um, Maimuna, who's also my wife, and her uh, mother, Olia. And they themselves are refugees, um, Ethiopian refugees. They came in the 80s. Um, her, or Maimuna's family, her parents met um, in a refugee camp in Somalia. Uh, that's where they got married. That's where Maimuna was born. Um, and this was in the early 70s, early 80s, um, around the time of, you know, civil conflict in Ethiopia. And they were resettled by the IRC, coincidentally, uh, to San Diego and um, lived in Orange County. They moved to Orange County for different opportunities. And Maimuna and her mother were always kind of involved in supporting uh, new families coming from East Africa specifically. Maimuna's mom was um, assisting resettlement agencies with interpreting. So specifically people coming from Somalia or coming from Ethiopia, she would help. Um, but through that work of interpreting, she saw a lot of families and how they needed a lot of support. Um, one was physical support. So basic items that were lacking in their households like beds, fridges, um, dishes, um, so she would come back and bring those items to them. Um, and then over time, you know, she would just visit the family just to see how they were doing, um, have a cup of coffee and just building a community and uh, would invite her um, daughter, Maimuna, along with her to do this work. And that was probably uh, throughout the 90s uh, that they did this grassroots work. Um, but then in 2000, as Maimuna got older, she saw that this work could actually grow into something more institutional, into a nonprofit. And um, she actually studied this as uh, part of her master's degree on how to create this grassroots work into an actual physical nonprofit. And in 2010, um, she started TIA with her mom as a 501c3. And uh, Tia uh, means my love in the Oromo language, one of the languages of Ethiopia. So it's their way of giving back, um, showing love for specifically at that time, refugee communities by helping them navigate a system that they themselves had to deal with on their own. And so kind of showing them how you become successful here. How do you build community? How do you help your, your kids? Because Maimuna herself grew up here as a child of refugee parents, or refugee herself. So she knew um, what that experience was like and really wanted to create programs to help um, the family as a whole, but also specifically for those kids. Wow. Talk about paying it forward, paying it back. Um, that is just such an amazing story. Uh, and let me ask you another question that's sort of on the side, but did it make a big difference once they attained the nonprofit status? Did that open up um, other resources to them that they didn't have otherwise? Yes, absolutely. I mean, as a nonprofit, you're able to accept more donations. Um, there's grant opportunities, sponsorship opportunities. So um, an increase in funds meant we could do more programs. We could help more families. 
um, and take on more um, more issues and um, and uh, needs that we were seeing families um, encountering. So definitely the funding pools were opened up for us as a 501c3. Um, and then of course, it's there's a strange, um, you know, legitimacy to the work that is attached to that um, status. You know, you can do a lot of great work and if you can prove that you're, I guess, approved by the government federally and, and statewide, um, people feel more comfortable with, uh, you know, working with you or volunteering with your, your agency. So we saw that, especially that shift of getting more attention and um, more people to back the work. Well, I know it adds a bit of a burden as far as reporting and some things like that, but it sounds okay. like it can really be beneficial. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit something else about um, your involvement with TIA. How did you get connected and, and involved? So it's actually a bit of a love story. Um, when I was uh, working at the IRC, I had a case of a family of 10. Uh, it was actually two families, total 10 individuals. Uh, coming from Iraq. And uh, as a case manager, my role is also to, to meet the family at the airport and then provide them transportation to their um, home or their apartment um, that night or that day. So um, at that time, I only had like a Honda Civic. So there was no way I was going to fit 10 people and all their luggage in my car. So I naturally had to look for support. And at that time, um, I was trying to see what organizations were in Orange County, because that's where the family was to be resettled. And I came across a few, but uh, it was Tia, or actually Maimuna, that uh, followed up with me very quickly and said that she and her mother could come out that day the family arrived with their van and transport families down to Orange County. So um, that's kind of how I first met them. And then at the airport, I was able to meet Aulia and Maimuna in person. Um, and we were able to help the family, but in the mix of all that, uh, you know, got really close to Maimuna, saw what an amazing woman she was and is. And so uh, it was funny because as a case manager, I am supposed to go the following day to do a home visit. Uh, but I also use it as an excuse to see Maimuna in Orange County. So when I was down there, we had our first lunch meeting. She thought it was a professional meeting, um, but it was more of like a date. And, and seven months later, I proposed and we were married. And so ever since then, I've just been involved in her work and supporting the organization um, as much as possible. But more recently, uh, in 2020, actually, in 2020, uh, I joined officially as a staff member as director of operation. Mm, okay. Well, you never know what's around the next corner, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you ought, always ought to be looking for, I guess, things that are coming around the next corner that are wonderful, positive potentials that you should take advantage of, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, where is TIA actually located in the programs? Are they all in one spot? Tell us about that. Uh, so our main office is in Santa Ana. So we have a physical address there. Uh, we host some workshops and definitely like registration takes place there with new families. Our case manager is um, based there and does a lot of his work. Um, most of our programs still are a bit virtual and in public areas. So we, we tend to host in parks, community centers, um, or through Zoom, uh, especially with our career placement work, a lot of those one-to-one -one uh, mm -hmm. meetings are done either over the phone or, or online. Uh, but we also uh, have a presence in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been building our work here. Uh, specifically, we have our social enterprise in LA. Uh, the restaurant for Flavors from Afar is located in Little Ethiopia. Um, we don't have an office for TIA yet, but we're working on it. And we're hoping to open something um, as soon as early next year. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, we certainly wish you well with that. And who knows, maybe there'll be some collaborations and resources that will evolve from this meeting today. That'd be um, great. <laughs> yeah. So you really serve people in the, the Orange County area, the LA area. That's a really broad spectrum. Yes. Uh, the majority of our families are in Orange County because um, okay. that's where the work 
initially started. So I would say 80% of the households that we serve are in OC, um, but we are seeing a growing number in LA, especially with a lot of asylees coming in and uh, new refugee families that have arrived from Afghanistan. Um, we've seen an uptick in registration in LA County. Um, so we're just trying to accommodate that. But yeah, uh, most of it is in OC, but we're trying to spread a bit further now. Okay. Um, so I see that from the website that TIA concentrates their programs in four different areas called cohorts. So tell us what these are and why you do this. So we wanted to address um, the most important needs that we saw in our families. And um, breaking them up into cohorts, we wanted to try and enroll smaller groups of people together to work in programs that would serve them. So not only to provide the service, but also for them to build community. Um, we have now, I believe, 214 active households, which is over 700 individuals. So we wanted to find a way to really serve each person, each family um, efficiently by condensing it down to cohorts. So cohorts gives us an opportunity to work with people in groups across the year and give them the attention that they need. Um, before, previously, when we had kind of like larger, broader programming, um, we felt we were just service-based. We were just kind of providing items, providing support, very generally and broadly and not really connecting with the families anymore, uh, which is what we were founded on, was that that interpersonal relationship was more important to us. And when we were starting to lose it, um, we shifted into this cohort system. Mm -hmm. And um, we focus on women and mothers as one. The second group is children and young adults. And the third is um, economic uh, advancement. So everyone that's specifically focused to find work and the last is community, which incorporates the families we work with, with the larger, broader community of volunteers and supporters and donors together. And under each cohort, there's different programs that we have that address the needs of each of those groups. Okay, so tell us about some of those programs, please. Um, so with women and mothers, I think that one is one of our most active. Uh, we have one program in particular called Tea and Tots. Uh, this is hosted once a month at a park or community center where we invite the women in our, our programs, especially the mothers, to come down and get some uh, essential items that they need for their children. So for example, diapers, baby wipes, toys, school supplies, um, each month it's a bit different, but consistently diapers because we know that's one of the biggest needs. And um, by inviting them to these public places, uh, we're also providing um, a space for the mothers to kind of relax and have their kids join them. Uh, usually the younger children, ages um, seven and under. And we'll host activities for the kids, so the tots. Uh, we, we have like arts and crafts and soccer that they engage in with our volunteers. And then the women have tea and uh, sit and have some like snacks and our volunteers engage them as well. And sometimes we will provide um, information, uh, especially around health, uh, women's health, um, different resources that we feel the, the mothers could benefit from and give them that time and space to just be amongst themselves. And, and that's what we do. I mean, it's pretty much just a, a way for everyone to connect with each other and still be receiving a service. Because previously, you know, we would just deliver diapers or people would pick them up at our office. And again, it started to feel very transactional and we weren't connecting. So this was our way of bringing that back, that connection. And especially after the pandemic, I think people were very um, hungry for that, um, you know, opportunity to connect in person again. And uh, again, like I said, we, we host it once a month. And uh, right now, primarily it's in Orange County. So that's one program, uh, I think, just to kind of highlight. Uh, the other, I would say, is the Economic Advancement Cohort. Um, we have two programs there that are very active. Uh, one is career placement. So we have a career placement specialist. Her name is Mira, who works with um, all the individuals in that specific cohort to find gainful employment. 
Um, so we're really looking at good jobs with good pay, and good benefits. Um, we don't want to employ them in, uh, in jobs that treat them poorly or, um, you know, uh, mistreat them, you know, because we see that too. Uh, we want to find them places where they feel safe and that they can actually grow. Um, and simultaneously, we do career, um, or excuse me, professional development. So we are cognizant of the fact that a lot of our refugees come here with, who are very educated or specialized in, in, in a certain sector of work, such as doctors, engineers, and lawyers, but um, their certificates don't um, transfer over. So they have to recertify which can be very challenging and very um, stressful and sometimes create a lot of depression or, you know, especially individuals who are a lot older and have been doctors for several years and now they're being asked to do dishes. So we try to show them that, yes, you have to sometimes work somewhere, but the path to returning in your professional career is possible. So we try to do that through that program. Um, and then lastly, the culinary program is the other uh, piece of the economic advancement cohort. And that's tied to our social enterprise flavors from afar. Um, and through the culinary program, we recruit um, individuals uh, that we see from our families who have a special love for food, um, used to be cooks or chefs back home, owned restaurants, and um, give them an opportunity to share their menus at our restaurant but also receive training. So through, through that like initial work that they do with presenting their cuisine, um, we have a program instructor who will work with them to understand their menu, but then also provide them um, culinary training on how to present their food in a different way, how to look at their food as something they could market on their own. And um, simultaneously with our program instructor, our career placement specialist, will work with these individuals to eventually help them find um, ways to start their own business, create licenses, um, start their own catering company, start their own restaurants. Uh, so that's, that's another step where if there are individuals who are very keen to become part of the culinary world, uh, we help them get there. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I did put the link to Flavors from Afar in the chat box. So I'm encouraging everybody who's on this call to check that out, go down there and, and have dinner at least, or find out more about it. So um, that how in the world did you come up with that idea? That is fantastic. Um, it actually came from our community. Um, it was at a time when Tia was going through some financial hardships. Um, I would say uh, 2018, 2019, we struggled uh, financially due to changes in you know, the government and um, financial pools of um, support that we had relied on um, were drying up because under the Trump administration, we saw refugee resettlement pretty much drop to zero, which meant so did the funding. And uh, as a result, we lost a lot of our resources. We were down to one staff member at one point. So it was a really tough time. And uh, I know Maimuna was even considering closing the doors. Um, but the families really stood up and said, you know, we want these programs. What do you need? How can we help? And uh, through conversations with various people, they pretty much presented the idea of, you know, you have tons of people in your community who cook amazing food from across the world and are actually cooking and selling their food on the side uh, to like local neighbors and family members. Um, why not use and harness this talent and have it be a way to support the org? Um, so that's what we did. We started by um, hosting auditions for about, I think 12, 15 people uh, from the community to be our first um, caterers. Um, so at the beginning, Flavors from Afar was a catering company, and uh, we hired uh, five, I believe five or six of the, the 12, and each of them presented a different cuisine. So we had Somali food, uh, Afghan food, uh, Syrian food, Iraqi food, and, uh, and we're just kind of giving these cooks opportunities to do jobs around Orange County and LA, and uh, over time, it started to really like catch. People were interested. 
and Mimuna got an opportunity to open up the restaurant uh, in, in, uh, in Little Ethiopia. So at that point, we saw Flavors as, um, as an opportunity to raise funds. And then eventually, as we grow, um, and you know, the restaurant industry, it, it takes time to really get on its feet. Um, we opened during the stay-at-home orders. <laughs> So very bad timing, especially for a restaurant, but uh, we're still here and doing very well. And uh, once profit begins to grow, 40% of that will go back to um, just programming at TIA. So that way we constantly have financial strength and support for ourselves. So becoming more self-sufficient. That's great. And it's so good to know that A, you survived and B, that the profits are coming in and things can only get better, right? I yes, know it's a so. <laughs> tremendously challenging business to be in, even with if you're just uh, doing it for other reasons. But oh gosh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you another question, and that's about one of your specific programs that you talked about, the career placement including the entry level jobs, opportunities that, that are there. So can you give us some examples of some kinds of jobs that people have been able to find? And here's a big question. Do they all require some level of proficiency in like English or Spanish? And are there any that don't require language proficiency um, or literacy? Mm -hmm. um, we try to look for um, opportunities that our um, families can apply for, whether they are English proficient or not. So there is there is a few jobs. So for example, um, we've done a lot of work with helping um, folks get jobs as security, security guards. That's a pretty, you know, um, good profession for those who have limited English. Um, they don't have to be very proficient, um, but know enough to kind of communicate. Um, and then we do find jobs in uh, different restaurants. We sometimes hire them at Flavors um, to work. So, you know, the restaurant industry, especially working as a dishwasher or um, doing the janitorial work doesn't require much English proficiency at all. So they're able to start. Um, we have a lot of uh, relationships with different employers. So um, construction industry is a big one. We actually are able to place a lot of people with apprenticeships first, and then they are eventually transitioned to doing work. Um, the ones that do require English, uh, we have relationships with software um, companies that are always looking for people um, to work at their industries. And you know, there's sometimes like low ent uh, low, um, uh, entry level positions, so they don't require too much background, but at least some understanding of tech. Um, and then we found jobs through the medical industry as well. Uh, we have some contacts there for our clients who are looking to recertify as nurses or doctors. So they have internship opportunities where they're learning the trade and getting experience as they're also pursuing their um, degree so they can work again in the medical uh, field. Um, but, you know, it's always growing. Uh, again, we have a, a fantastic career placement specialist. Mira's looking for um, new opportunities, developing relationships with new employers every day. I'm always trying to keep up with her. So uh, I think she's doing a great job. And, you know, we, we're a bit lucky because at this time, uh, there is there is a lot more um, job opportunities available. Um, because for whatever reasons, a lot of people aren't going back to work. So there's been job opportunities that we've been just jumping into and developing these relationships with employers with the understanding that they're hiring refugees. And I think they're more inclined to do that because they either want to give back, they want to support, they want to help in some way. Um, so that's kind of our, uh, kind of our pitch is how we were able to get a lot of people to uh, work with our with our refugee families. And I imagine they really understand, at least some of them, the benefits of hiring someone who's a refugee because you know you've got that tremendous desire and that, that tremendous ambition that's there. These are yes. usually people who have gone through a lot to get where they are and have great hopes and aspirations for the future, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question that's come up and it says, does Tia offer language support? 
Mm. In other words, translators, uh, interpreters, I mean, and um, language lessons, ESL classes, anything like that or connections to those resources? Yes, we do. So we have another program uh, that's directed towards the women. It's called um, Coffee and Conversation. And that's about building English vocabulary and um, conversational skills with a group of people. We have an ESL instructor that meets with them once a month and pretty much just helps them to speak and learn the language. Um, mm -hmm. We also do volunteer mentoring and a lot of our mentors will establish one-to-one -one relationships with families and also incorporate um, English lessons. So really helping them to speak um, is our priority. Uh, there's various resources at community colleges where you could learn uh, English at a more academic level. So like the grammar and spelling. So we feel that's already um, available, but to speak um, it's, it's harder. So we try to provide that as a service and specifically for the women, because we see that many of the mothers tend to stay home. They stay with the family, they stay with the kids. So they're not using the language and they're not really practicing. So we want to make sure that they're learning as well as everyone else in the family. Um, but we also uh, provide interpreting services in-house. So we have a case manager from Afghanistan who speaks Pashto, Dari, and Farsi. We have people who speak Arabic, um, Somali, Swahili, French, Spanish. So we have different people on our team who are able to interpret and provide translation support. So those are actual permanent staff, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, either staff or board members who step in. <laughs> Okay, so staff or volunteers in, mm -hmm. in, in both of those areas. And I assume you, for people who need that formal education and want to take those community college classes and so forth, you probably connect them with the ways to, to, to find those resources, right? Help them enroll and... Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we have relationships with a few of the local community colleges and specifically Irvine and Anaheim. Mm -hmm. And we'll develop like either referral systems or provide the resources to our family. Mm hmm. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, so let's see what are, let's ask about the challenges. I mean, we, we can imagine funding challenges and things like that. But what are some of the, the major challenges that you have? And maybe some of the ways that you find that you haven't already already described of meeting those challenges in creative and in innovative ways? Um, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen right now is housing. Um, many of our new families are struggling to find affordable housing. Um, there's been an influx of Afghan families that are now or were staying in motels um, because of the delay in finding um, proper units for their families to stay in. And there's various reasons for that, uh, the, the difficulties and challenges um, resettlement agencies have had with uh, finding apartments. Um, I know a lot of our, you know, local community uh, organizations and some of our partners are actively working on this issue. Um, for one example, there's the Afghan Refugee Relief Coalition. They really stepped up and helped try to address this issue. And we've worked side by side with them on a few occasions um, to help with housing. Uh, but it's been a very difficult and daunting experience for us. Uh, we're not uh, traditionally set up to help with that. Um, but we've come across now a few cases that are um, experiencing homelessness. We've had some families in shelters. And uh, these are not just from Afghanistan. I mean, families we work with from other parts of the world, just they can't find uh, a place to stay in Southern California. And... Uh, our way of addressing it is we're trying to create now an in-house program and hire a housing specialist so that we can work with our partners who do housing and support them in ways to you know, address this challenge. Because there's groups like Families Forward that already do um, housing, but they provide housing you know, for all homeless in uh, Orange County. Um, but they're now seeing an influx of refugees coming to their doorstep. So, we're trying to see, well, how can we help them with working through the, the challenges they face with that community? And then on our end, how can we really create relationships with property managers, um, individuals that want to open up their homes or open up uh, like a, a room 
temporarily to house these uh, these people who are just struggling. And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're on our own now kind of trying to create the resource. And that's something that we do at TIA, which I, I've always valued is um, we don't get too stuck on one thing. If there's a need that is in our face that our families want us to address, we will shift or we'll adapt um, if we can. And you know, if there's programs that people don't need anymore, then we'll put them to sleep. So we're always like trying to find ways to be um, up to date with the needs that our families have. And right now, housing has been, and unfortunately, I see will continue to be uh, an issue that we have to address. Yeah, I think when you're a smaller organization, one of the advantages of that is that you can be a bit more nimble. You can address the needs, and you can you can. Um, I hate to use this word pivot, but you can turn towards the things where that need more focus as they occur. Um, so one of one of our questions in the chat is that um, whether the families connected with TIA program get government assistance and how long does that last? Yes, the refugees do. Uh, refugee families are part of a, a government program that's uh, it's called RCA, Refugee Cash Assistance Program. So they're able to apply for that and receive resources in the form of cash, food stamps, and Medi-Cal. Um, unfortunately, the cash assistance is very meager, especially in the state of California. Um, to give you an example, an individual will receive up to, uh, well, back in my day, it was like $300. It might have gone up a bit to maybe four, uh, but not much more. Uh, and that is supposed to be the cash assistance to cover rent, utilities, and all other expenses other than food. Um, food stamps tend to be generous, so luckily we don't see um, hunger <laughs> as, a, as a problem that families face with this program, but homelessness, yes, because the, it's just not enough money for anyone, and it's limited. Um, for a individual or couple, it's uh, eight months of uh, support that they receive. Families, after eight months, they can switch over to CalWORKs, so then they're put into the general um, government assistance program and receive pretty much the same benefits, um, but it lasts longer versus those that are um, only up to eight months. And I would assume that once someone's involved in employment, that that somewhat reduces those benefits, although I, I guess it comes out to be more than if there were no employment. Is that a, probably an accurate picture? Yeah, yes, that's right. And that's why with our career placement program, we really try to find good jobs so that if they transition into a position with a good salary, then they don't need the government assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen some that work, you know, in some conditions where it's um, they get paid under the table, but it's it's not the way you want to go. Um, it can also uh, negatively affect their not only their benefits, but it could be um, they could be legally charged for misusing the system, which has happened. Um, and then, of course, if you have a job where you're taking money under the table, it probably means you're not making enough and you're trying to keep your benefits. So we don't want our families to have to juggle that. We want them to move out of government assistance and feel comfortable and confident in the new position that they're working in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the chat with a question about the housing that you the housing crisis problem that you were addressing before. And that, and that is recently there is a move to build ADUs, those accessory dwelling units. And do those seem to help the situation at all? Are there places available that are ADUs that families could move into that you know about or find out about? I don't know. I'm not actually uh, very familiar with that. So that I'm glad someone brought that up because we definitely look into it. I, I believe the, the staff at our org who are working more closely with this situation might be familiar, but as for myself, I'm not. Yeah, they're just kind of, you know, grandmother units or what have you that are built on a property or an, an additional living space that before you couldn't have, but now it's become more, more um, possible to do that. Let's ask uh, what currently are your major sources of funding, if you don't mind? Sure, no, not at all. Um, we receive a lot of. Um, foundational support, so grants. Um, some of our partners include the Sun Family Foundation, uh, PIMCO, Hogue, um, just to name a few. So they provide 
general support um, in the form of funding. Uh, so like general operating funding, and then some that are specifically towards our program. So we get a lot of uh -oh. directed, um, or excuse me, restricted funding for like, everything okay? Yeah, you're back on, it was frozen for a second. Oh, I was frozen, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, we get restricted funds that go specifically to programs. So like our economic advancement, there's earmarked funding for that so that we ensure we have a staff member and the program continues on. Um, outside of that, individual gifts, um, we've always hosted community events, fundraisers, and we have a, a, a very large pool of individuals who have consistently given to the organization. Um, and then of course, once it's ready, the social enterprise will be the next source of funding that we're looking to. Um, we don't do government contracts anymore. Uh, we went through that experience and are done with it. So that's why uh, we're shifting our focus towards community, towards different family foundations, and um, and then the social enterprise eventually. Is is that focus more in the Orange County area, or do you have some good connections and resources in Los Angeles as well at this point? Primarily, it's in Orange County, especially with the foundations. But uh, we're breaking ground slowly in LA. Um, LA is very different political beast. So we're just trying to understand how to kind of get into that network and build partnerships with foundations. Um, there's a few who are interested. So that's why we're, we're looking to next year to start our office in LA once we have um, secured uh, some funds. Yeah, partnerships, collaborations with funding donor sources and so forth, and other organizations where you can share resources and help each other. That's just the best, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Are there volunteer opportunities at TIA? Yes, absolutely. So there's um, two forms. There's the community volunteer and then there's the mentor. Um, as a mentor, that's where you get a one-to-one -one experience with a family or an individual. And in that role, you're able to help somebody or a family um, learn English, um, support them as like a job coach. So if you're interested in professionally supporting them, that's another way. Um, and then just developing a relationship. With mentoring, we also see it as, you know, friendship building. So you're kind of going in consistently to see if there's questions the family has, um, if there's resources that can be provided um, to just kind of be there to immediately address needs when possible. And then if it's out of the scope of the mentor, our case manager steps in. So there's always um, like a supervisional um, component to it where mentors aren't just thrown into a household and left to be. Uh, we are trying our best now to have case management as part of that experience so that we're looking at the experience of the volunteer and the family. Um, for community-based volunteering, that's where we invite people to come to like tea and pots, um, to volunteer for one day, but either hosting activities, um, working or speaking with our families about different resources or information. Um, and that is again, where, where we have that opportunity. And eventually when we bring back soccer, we'll be looking for volunteers there to, you know, as soccer coaches or um, helping kids on. So those, those are what we have right now. T tell us again about that soccer program. I don't remember if we talked about that. What is that? So we, um, Tia really started with soccer. Uh, one of the first programs was soccer directed towards youth. Um, we had a partnership with Soccer Without Borders and um, back in 2011, I want to say, uh, we hosted a week-long soccer camp. And we thought maybe like 20, 30 kids would show up. Uh, we had 66. So there was definitely a need. Uh, there was a desire from the families and the kids to get involved in soccer. So that program really developed and grew over the years to become a, a weekly uh, curriculum. Uh, and then to the point where we almost had like formed a TIA soccer group that was competing with like AYSO and other teams. So we were really like advanced in our in our program. But then, you know, the pandemic hit and we had to stop uh, soccer for for quite some time. Um, we haven't brought it back yet because we're just being careful and then also trying to reimagine the program 
in the event that something like this were to happen again, we don't mm -hmm. want to have to shut down the program. So if we want soccer to be consistently provided, if there's another pandemic, how do we have soccer still be available or still be a program in that, uh, in those types of crises? So uh, that's why we've been very careful about how to bring it. So we'll see. This summer, we're, we want to at least start it because all the kids are, are asking for it. So we're, we can't, you know, <laughs> ignore the, the needs of the people. So we're going to do our best to bring back soccer. Sometimes circumstances cause us to be really creative and, and, and uh, innovative in, in how we respond to these things. Yeah. A couple of other good questions in the chat. One is uh, about the, the um, things like Tea for Tots and some of the other programs where people need transportation. Uh, Nancy asks, in gathering the cohort groups, such as the mothers and children, how do you handle the transportation challenge and finding the space to meet? That's an excellent question. It's a, uh, it's actually a, 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 um, a problem that we face all the time. Um, transportation, we are very creative. Sometimes if um, one of the families has a van or has a car, we ask them to help us with bringing families out because um, they tend to live very close to each other. And uh, if there's somebody within that community that's able to help bring families, uh, then we'll work with them and we'll compensate them for mileage. Um, our staff as well will, will assist with transporting some of our families, especially ones that are a bit further out of uh, the location of the uh, event. Um, then we'll, we'll try to bring them as, uh, as a courtesy. Um, finding space is, is a little hard uh, because we have a lot of families in Irvine, a lot of families in Anaheim. So there's it's a little hard to find a, a, a meeting ground that is between the two. Because then part of the issue is, well, if we find something in the middle, sometimes it's just too far for both sides and they don't go. Um, if we put it just in Anaheim, Irvine is excluded. So we have to kind of move around. So we'll pick a location that's in Anaheim and really concentrate our efforts on those surrounding families to attend. And then the next events we'll do in Irvine. So Unfortunately, there's some people that don't get to participate, but at some point they will. So that's kind of how we've been trying to uh, work that out. Um, another thing we wanna do is we're actually thinking of changing our office. Um, it's a bit out of the way um, and we've noticed people not coming out to our facility as often. So we might move. So we're a little closer to the families that we serve. So we'll see. So, but yeah, that's a challenge that, you know, we're still constantly dealing with. Yeah. Okay. Here's a question about uh, job interviews. And uh, Deborah asks, do you have clothing for interviews and job applications, for example? Um, yes, we have a partnership with a group. I cannot think of their name right now, which is horrible. But there is a group uh, that does provide clothing, uh, professional clothing to our families. So um, we don't do it, but we work with others who, who do provide that. So yes. Um, for interviews and jobs, um, we, we try to get them connected so they have a nice suit or nice dress to go into interviews. Okay, that's another instance where you're looking for a resource and you're making that connection to the resource that, that's available, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, you did you say that you have about 215 families actively involved right now? Yes, about 215, 215, yeah. Wow, and, and and that grew from a very small number. What was is this probably the the height of um, the, as how many families you've worked with at a time? Have there been more in the past, or you're just on a constant growth curve? No, there's been more. At our height, we were at 336. Mm -hmm. um, this was you know prior to COVID um, and prior to funding cuts, um, we were a lot larger and had a, a bit more resources to handle more families. Um, after the pandemic, it shrank down to about 150, I would say. Um, and then it's now growing again. But we're, we're trying to be mindful about the numbers where we don't want to take on too many and then not provide uh, adequate services. We'd rather have a a manageable amount of families we work with and, and do the best we can to really help them. So that's something that's an in-house conversation right now is where do we cap it? 
we don't want to because we feel we don't want to turn anyone away but at the same time we don't want to provide um you know inadequate services to them so that's it's it's a conversation yeah now um there's a specific question about one group of people, and that is um, Nancy is is part of a group that's helping Afghan families, and she's asking if, if you know of an enclave of Afghan families living close to each other in either in Orange County or in Los Angeles. Yes, there is. Um, but I'm not 100% sure where anymore. It changes. And it changes based on where um, housing is available. So there's been um, larger groups growing in Anaheim, specifically by, oh, geez, I want to say, um, well, I can't think of it right now, but there, there's a part of Anaheim where a lot of families tend to congregate in these different apartment units where there's a lot of you know, access, the property managers there are already familiar with refugee families, so they're able to get in a lot faster. Um, so specifically Anaheim. Um, outside of Anaheim, it's, 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 a, it's starting to grow in different areas. Irvine is another area. I don't know specifically where yet, but there are a growing enclave of Afghan families in, in Irvine right now. In LA, um, it's the valley, uh, San Fernando Valley, like Lucida and uh, now, even Santa Clarita, like there's a growing number of Afghan families. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not very uh, helpful with that question. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I imagine that's a pretty dynamic thing. I, I imagine that it's kind of in a state of flux because as people find a place to go, other people find that place or somewhere in that vicinity, and and it's it's um, something like, oh, my, fa my family moved to California back in 1920, and so a bunch of us followed that kind yeah. of thing. And there's a lot of secondary migration happening too. So some families, once they kind of get a sense of life in Southern California, and if it's a bit difficult, they will move. So they're moving to different states. Some are moving further north to areas um, where there's larger Afghan communities. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, Sorry, why I can't think of my geography right now. There's another city closer to like Sacramento, Northern California, where there's a very large Afghan community. And I know there's been families moving up there, mm -hmm. uh, but other states as well, just because it's more affordable. Um, and it's um, there's some there's a little bit more uh, employment opportunities as well. They've been trying to find different locations. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, I think we're close to the end of the program. Is there... Let me ask you a really important question. Uh, if you could give us all a challenge today, what would that be? I would say First of um, all. definitely try to understand as much as you can about these families that are resettling um, to Southern California, Orange County, LA, and um, like make an effort to kind of know more about who they are and about their background outside of the current conflict. Um, I think a lot of us um, are glued to the TV screens and we know what's happening right now. But you know, these families come from countries that have ancient histories, that have very rich culture and traditions, and those don't get highlighted all the time. So I think it's up to us as community members to make an effort to know where these families are coming from what is their histories? What is the food they eat? What is the language they speak? And, um, and to respect them and to provide respect as the first engagement, being um, on level ground with these individuals, even though they've suffered and they've experienced and continue to experience trauma. Um, you know, a lot of these individuals are educated, are um, survivors, they're, um, you know, fun to be around, they're comical, they're, they're, they love music, they love art. There's so much dimension to all of these individuals. We should not focus only on their um, suffering. Um, I see sometimes there's also an infantilization that happens with our clients where people come in just to save uh, the family, but you know they need more than that. They need to be treated as equal partners and um, to be respected as such because they need to see that their growth and development in this country 
is um, as open and, and that they have as much opportunities to be successful as any one of us. Um, so I think that's, that's something we can all do is by trying to carry that message when we talk to these people and to always make an effort to understand them because believe me, they understand a lot about the US. Before they come here, they've studied what the US is. They have their own cultural orientations and they, they're very knowledgeable about this country. So we should try to know about who they are too. Hmm. Because when it comes right down to it, each of us is a human being with family, with background, with loves, with um, history, and with um, something valuable and, and wonderful to contribute mm -hmm. to this community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough, Shukri, not only for being with us today and sharing all of this. I did put the TIA um, website in the chat, so I encourage everyone to check out that organization. Your foundation is just phenomenal, what you've been doing with people and what you've been doing for all of us, for the community as a whole, is just um, just exceptionally marvelous. And uh, we're so inspired and so grateful for you to be here. Uh, I will also suggest that people continue to tune in to this program once a month and continue to look for other ways to get involved with the South Coast Interfaith Council. Um, we're a varied organization with lots of different programs and endeavors, and we love to have your participation and your support. So please support TIA Foundation, please support South Coast Interfaith Council, and reach out and make a new friend and a new neighbor if you can. And thank you all for being with us. I've got lots of comments in the chat about what a wonderful message and what we are so grateful for your knowledge and experience that you've shared with us today. Thanks for the great work and that you make our community richer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shukri. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Stay tuned and come back again. Bye-bye. <laughs>